All right. Let's see here. Am I live? A little bit. Besides this, I don't like this delay. Why do I have a delay? Okay, so this is a inaugural. Wait, echo. It's an inaugural live stream. Oh, I should turn this off. Okay, now you don't hear the echo, right? Okay. Okay, can you? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I know, I know that bad account. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre. I keep banning it from my page. The bats are upon us. Did you guys see my Bolivian bats story? Hey, why is this so slow and jerky when I have an Ethernet connection? Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open. I don't need to be looking over here. Hey, guys. This is my first live stream. So bear. Well, I've done them off the phone, but I bought this $1,000 software, but it's not that thrilling at the moment. But don't worry. I always figure everything out. Let's see here. There's a massive delay. Okay. The press bean. Fun fact. Portland is the whitest city. Okay. Who just gave me $5? Joseph Leach. Shout out to SPFPA Local 603. I do support unions. Salute. Thank you for the $5. Okay. Why was she arrested? Tokyo James. Well, she was arrested for money laundering and continuing to be involved in uh, the logistical oversight of bringing in marijuana, methamphetamine, cocaine, and heroin. It's continuing her husband's business. Okay, YouTube Live be lagging. You're good. Okay, good. That's good to know. Just get on with it. Okay, Gold Wolf. What's going to happen if I don't? All right, Depressed Bean, tell us the story. So, uh, Emma Cornell was her name. And when she was 17, she met El Chapo at a dance down in Sinaloa. She had been crowned uh, Miss Guava in Coffee for Sinaloa Province. And uh, yeah, Chapo's wife is in jail. She had been crowned a Miss Guava in Coffee for Sinaloa Province. Her uncle was a man named Nacho Coronel, who was known as the King of Crystal. He was, um, I guess, instrumental in when there was a crackdown in the United States on domestic crystal methamphetamine production in small labs and the uh, cartel got into it in a big way. He was kind of in charge of that and he supposedly got killed. And that's uh, El Chapo's wife's uncle and that was her connection to the cartel. And much like the Italian mafia, you know, at that level of criminality, those guys like to have women around that are from uh, that same sort of family background because you can't you can't get a crash course training in how to you know navigate and not do the wrong things. You kind of have to be born and indoctrinated into it. Al Chap Al Chapo. Oh man, I liked it. I'm going to start using it. Why take the chance doesn't make sense. Well, you could, okay, someone said, you think she was no, she was being watched. Why take the chance doesn't make sense. Well, remember, at that level, I mean, the, the Mexican cartels are ingrained into the Mexican economy. I mean, they're ingrained into the U.S. economy. A tremendous amount of money in our banking system is coming from there. She's interacting with probably Mexican politicians and big business people all the time. And, uh, you know the show must go on, uh, <clears throat> just like if the if the um, CEO well over in Japan, I think this or in Korea, the CEO of Hyundai 
got into criminal trouble for covering up some defects that caused some deaths. I mean, it doesn't mean the next person didn't keep running the show. You know, there's too much money being made. Now, what is weird and stupid is she got taken into custody, correct me if I'm wrong, in, oh, where did she get taken into custody? She was sent to the U.S. That's probably what she thought. She was sent, she was taken into custody. Let's see where she was taken into custody. Then I'll give you the political background on that. Alexander Alexander Detention Center. Oh, Alexandria, Virginia. Okay, so that's next to Washington, D.C. Oh, she was arrested at Dulles Airport. Oh, that's weird. So I agree with you guys that it's kind of surprising that she would have been taken into custody into the United States itself. Um, do you think she'll cooperate the feds against the Sinaloa cartel leaders? Uh, probably if she knows anything about them. So um, El, El Mayo is probably at the top of the food chain now. And um, But the question is, why would she know anything about El Mayo? It's a misunderstanding of the cartel system to think that there's this strict hierarchy where they all know what each other are doing. It's more set up on the model of guerrilla warfare uh, cells. So, I mean, even the, the Medellin and the Cali cartels are set up like this. So you have one group of people in a city and they know what drugs they receive and who they send money to. So Emma Coronel probably had suppliers in Colombia and Mexico, and then she had um, logistics people that would get it into the U.S. and other countries, and then she had people that would sell it, and then other people that launder the money and return it, and so El Mayo has his own vertical set of cells like that, and she may not know enough to tell anything. It would be cool if I could interview Al Chapo or, or Emma Cornell. Oh, well, should I interview the Pope and God also? Basically, she just continued the business. I tried telling people Al Chapo's just a fall guy. He's not the top boss. Well, sure. There is really no top boss. I mean, the there's a lot of people benefiting, and most of them are in the Mexican government and the Mexican business sector, and uh, I always forget, and the, the global business and governmental sector. It's basically like Fortune Five company Fortune five hundred companies along with guerrilla warfare. That's a good good uh good analogy. Isn't her father Nacho Coronel? No, I just explained that her uncle is Nacho Coronel. Yes, I'm gonna do some stuff about the Toronto gangs. There's so many interesting things and then I'll post something and forget to do it. To be honest with you, I've been spending a lot of time these last few months just uploading all my old stuff to Facebook because Facebook is monetized now too. So I'm getting money, same new money for the same stuff from Facebook. And I'm also investing time into always trying to develop a staff around me, which is pretty hard so I can grow. What do you say about, oh, Say Chi Lap got arrested in Europe? So you guys know more than me. Tell me more about Say Chi Lap getting arrested in Europe, Jake the, Jack the Flipper. Which cartel has the best blow? Well, they're not the one making up the blows. The guys on the streets are making up the blows. And the Mexicans are sending in that, that uh, Mexican brown, which... I don't think competes with China white mixed with fentanyl, which is what's going on in the Midwest and the East Coast. Because it's all being cut, Logan Boxing, underscore Logan Boxing 9-11. Is anybody else arrested with her? Don't know. Mencho is the man now. Yeah, I guess, but it's hard to know what the truth is because I read a lot about Mencho being gravely or seriously ill with, I think, a kidney issue. So, I mean, no, Mitchell could be dead. Oh, he got arrested in the Netherlands. Your daily dose what? I don't know.
Ooh. You can give a shout out to Brazil, specifically to Brasilia, Federal District of Brazil. Great content you've been making, man. Keep up the good job. Two fab. Well, thank you from down in Brazil. I've actually, oh, I was going to, I've visited Brazil. My friend got married uh, some years ago to a woman from Belo Horizonte. So I flew into Rio, spent some time in Rio, and then we all drove to Belo Horizonte. But Brasilia is a place I want to visit. One of my, uh, interest when I'm not, uh, well, crime is what I make money on, but one of my interests is um, demography and planning in Brasilia, which is where he wants me to give a shout out to. Shout out to Brasilia. Brasilia is the capital of Brazil. It was designed by uh, Arthur, or no, Oscar Niedermeyer, who was an important architect in the mid century. Uh, ideas of Luc Le Corbusier. And it was built in the dead center of Brazil, and it's a very modern, weird-looking uh, city, and I want to visit it sometime. I hate how much content Vlad makes now, Al. How little Al does. as of recently. Well, Vlad doesn't really make content. Vlad hits the record button. Think about that. That part. Amazon is selling melanin in a jar. Wait, are you serious? Amazon selling melanin. I should. Th I want to get into the snake oil game. When will Cocaine Commodore come to Amazon Prime? Whenever I finish it. We have great architecture here indeed. Too fab. Hit me up on Instagram. DM me. I'm Al Prophet. And when I come to Brazil, I'll visit you in Brasilia. No, Don Easy. It's not on Amazon Prime. It's not, it's not quite finished. Do you think 2021 will be Bobby Schmurter's year? Yeah, I mean, if he can make... A hot song, which he probably can, but I mean, he's definitely got, you know, ultimate street cred. The ugliest couch and blanket. Well, actually, this house is in uh, an area that's known for mid-century architecture. And uh, the person who furnished the house is into keeping the furnishings in what the style of the area is, which is like the 1970s. Though we did just get this. I should have an A&E special. Well, you know what? I mean, they pay less than I make doing this. A&E once tried to pay me $6,000 a month. $6,000 a month don't even pay my basic bills. Jason Hunt, thank you. I appreciate it. Would you like to see a narco Southeast Asia season? Yeah, that actually, I didn't think of that, think of that but that would be pretty damn interesting. But a bio about how you got into drug history. Well, I mean, there's actually, if you watch all my stuff, I, I drop hints about my sordid past hippie couch. Well, no, it's not really hippie. It's 60s. Big Meech ain't getting out till his release date. What kind of big major productions you're working on? AP, I know you got something that works. I do actually building up to do a movie called Milligram. Did a movie about 10 years ago called The Ghost of St. Alban, which made it into Redbox. And, uh, yeah. Considering doing any videos on Carlos Marcello. Well, watch Killing Jimmy Off. I talk about Carlos Marcello extensively. And uh, for those who don't know, Carlos Marcello was the mob boss of New Orleans. And according to some FBI reports, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 60s and 70s, they considered him the single most powerful Mafia boss. They're going to try to give a deal to get info on Chapel's son. If that don't work, she'll face 5 to 40. That depends what she was doing. She could go straight to life, do not pass go. What happened with that 7-year-old girl in A&E? Well, the A&E person got probation. The cop uh, uh, had three mistrials or two mistrials and then didn't charge him again. Warren Evans went on to be, who was the chief of police, went on to be the chief executive of Wayne County. And the little girl's family got like $8 million. Her father's doing 10 to 20. And her uncle is doing life no parole for killing the 16-year-old. Someone commented on the dopeness of my shirt. Yes, it is a Golden Girl shirt. You got to be real street. I wear something like this, so he'll get beat up. 
Marcelo was not a Chicago boss. He was the boss. Carlos Marcelo was the boss of New Orleans, buddy. Santo Traficante was the boss in Tampa. Marcelo was the boss of New Orleans. Those were the first two cities to have a, a substantial Sicilian population. And they have two of, had two of the most powerful mob families, and they were not answerable to the Mafia Commission. In fact, if you watch Killing Jimmy Offa, I talk about how when Bonanno, Joe Bonanno tried to off several of the uh, other mob bosses in New York and take over, and then he had to flee to Arizona, he was under the protection of Traficante and Marcello, and there was going to be a national mob war with um, the New York families on one side, and Traficante and Marcello and possibly Chicago on the other side. And they were battling chiefly over control of the Teamsters Pension Fund, which at the time was the largest pool of private money in the world. And that was what's used for massive building projects and etc. Will you do an expose on the Dixie Mafia? Well, you know, the Dixie Mafia is one of those things that's, um, did it really exist, right? There's lots of uh, white, redneck, hillbilly, whatever you want to call them, serious criminals, some of them very sophisticated, but there was no, you know, organized group across many states. There were many small Dixie Mafias, and we have, do have some stories on Gangster Report about that, but maybe I'll do one about the fact that Greg Allman, of Allman Brothers fame, his... Uh, manager was supplying drugs to a lot of bands and stuff and he Greg Allman told on his manager who was a member of a Dixie Mafia. So Greg Allman, another uh music industry informant. What up though, Miami? Unsolved Mystery Screets throwback. I already talked about Chapel's wife. You missed it. Some mobsters got popped using strip clubs to launder their cash. Oh, that's standard. I mean, in uh, in Detroit, you know, even in the black strip clubs, the, the mob is behind most of them. And, yeah, they launder their money. Right now, I was reading African Muslims in Antebellum America and In the Name of Allah about Clarence 13X, the guy who broke away from the Nation of Islam to start the 5 percenters. What you smoking on, Al? Because I don't really – I smoke – the only thing I smoke is – Cigarillos with the tobacco in them. Any interest in doing a doc on Biden, Bulger, Bulgler, Harry Mafia? You think Rafael Edmonds going to be released? Oh, a judge re reduced the sentence. Yeah, he'll get out. Here's the thing. The feds have to let the streets know that the big snitches get out. Or else guys will stop snitching, right? And then if they see these big guys get out, maybe other people in prison will make a phone call and say, hey, I got something I want to tell too. Ireland, thank you. 100%. Louisiana is the first mafia in the United States. Everybody had to take orders. Well, I don't think they're taking orders from Louisiana. But Louisiana certainly wasn't taking orders from them. And like I said, Carlos Marcello was estimated by the FBI around the time of Kennedy's assassination to be the most powerful mafia boss in the country. What's your favorite book? Well, there's no such thing as a favorite book. I've, I've read so many books I couldn't say. Off the top of my head, one very interesting book I read in jail was written about the year 1905 by a West Point instructor. He had been a Union general in the Civil War, and the book was about comparing warfare in the ancient world and comparing the three greatest military leaders of the ancient world, Hannibal, Julius Caesar, and Alexander the Great. You might want to look that up. Nothing on Mexican Mafia California faction. Man, I got a lot of notes and emails to myself to do Mexican Mafia stuff. Have you guys, um, there's a channel called Stories from Our Current Prisoner on YouTube. And it's a great channel. All it is, the guy has people, everyone has to call in. I think they're almost all calling in from prison. A few might not be. And they're, a lot of them are in the shoe. A lot of them are gang dropouts, like real gang dropouts. And they tell some serious stories 
So go check out um, Stories from a Current Prisoner. Be careful with that 48 Laws of Power book. You know, a guy who's a good writer and knows a lot of history, which Robert Greene is, or me, I could go through different historical episodes and pick out things and make them make sense. It doesn't mean you should apply them to your life. Remember, almost all of those 48 laws, or probably all of them, same things with Machiavelli's The Prince, sort of written for times of warfare and conflict. And that's one way of looking at human history, but it's only one in, um, you know, guys that go to jail and spend all their time reading the art of war and the 48 laws of power. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's good for you. And in fact, telling people you read the 48 laws of power and telling them they should read it is a, is a form of power manipulation in and of itself. Cause then I now make you think I'm a master of control. So maybe that makes it easier for me to control you. And I have you spend all your time reading books about war when you should be learning other things. Yeah, you're right. That channel is dropouts. I mean, what, what, what do you think prison's made up of? The re, you know, this idea that all the snitches get stabbed in prison is so ridiculous because half of the guys walking around told on some case at some time. Believe that. Do a documentary about Detroit rappers. Well, we did a whole Blade Icewood documentary, but uh, due to um, internal conflict among people involved, it didn't come out. What's your thoughts behind Behold the Pale Horse? Well, it was written by a white supremacist. Thought you were Dennis Hopper. I am Dennis Hopper. Did you guys know that when Dennis Hopper died, he had like $300 million worth of art? He had like a $10 million house in Venice Beach, and he had like $300 million in art. Because when he was an actor in the 60s and 70s, he was buying Jasper Johns and Andy Warhols when that stuff was cheap. I believe Rafe will been home. He might be. I said that a while ago. It wouldn't shock me. Thank you for the congratulations, Stephen. Yeah, there's endless, endless um, crime content. I need some staff. Nobody wants to edit. And all these kids nowadays, they, they can't read more than a page. And by kids, I mean like people 30 and under. Everyone's lazy. Everyone wants to tell me they got what camera they have. Pony boys, what up, though? Um, I don't care what camera you got. Anybody can hit the record button. I need people that have a college education and can edit. Blade said, what up? Yeah, wasn't Cooper a white supremacist, or am I confusing him with the guy that wrote the Turner Diaries? I'm pretty sure he, uh, maybe he wasn't a white supremacist, but white supremacists use that book. So be careful with that book. Who do you think runs the world? Listen, if you learn nothing from me, learn this. If you learn nothing from studying these big crime organizations, learn this. Yes, there's all sorts of secret conspiracies. There's many Illuminatis, but they all have conflicting, sometimes overlapping, but often conflicting interests. What is this grand master one plan that you think people would have? I mean, what do you think rich people do with their money to get more girlfriends, to make sure their kids are taken care of, to buy a bigger yacht, they buy, build a ship to go to the rocket, to go to the moon? I mean, there's no one plan. There's a bunch of Illuminatis and a bunch of conspiracies. I mean, hey, if if there weren't multiple mafias, if there weren't other ethnic groups competing with those multiple, multiple mafias, organized crime would probably already run the country. So a lot of people run the world, which means nobody run, runs the world. What you need to think about is who's influencing your community or the events of your life. Because now that's probably a smaller cast of characters. Watch my Barry Seal documentary, Legend 28. It wasn't Cooper, it was a guy from Turner Diaries. The guy from Turner Diaries was not killed in Ruby Ridge. Those people were reading Turner Diaries. But Cooper's book, Behold a Pale Horse, is also an, an important, is used a lot by white supremacists. But the, but the Turner Diaries really is. Now those, I might do a story on those guys, The Order. 
The order was the was a white supremacist thing in the mid eighties, but they weren't your run of the mill white supremacist clowns. They killed Alan Berg, an important Jewish radio personality, and they robbed an armored truck for like five million dollars. And they would have got away with it, but one of them, they had one of them pass and counterfeit money, and he got caught and told on the rest. And one of them, uh, I think he he's did he just die or he might have just died in federal prison. I mean. And those guys going to prison in the mid '80s, federal prison, were an important thing. With a lot of the white inmates moving, maybe they didn't really believe in white supremacy, but like those white supremacist groups becoming very powerful in the prisons. Ed Manifesto, I know, I don't know who that is. High level grandmasters are family already established for hundreds of years. Yeah, I mean, there's very powerful groups of families that have a lot of power. I mean. The Rothschilds, I mean, yeah, that stuff's real. They don't run the world. They have a tremendous amount of power, and they certainly protect their own. But, you know, one of the Rothschilds just, one of them just died at like the age of 58 or something. So, you know, it's not like they have mastery over uh, time and space. If you, want to, if you want to see a Rothschild, though, and see what kind of things that people that have had that much money for that, uh, no such thing as black supremacists. It's not possible. Big boy blue, what are you, a fake crip? Um, if you want to see a Rothschild, there's a British show where a British dandy uh, goes around antiquing. And one of the guys he goes to see is this Lord Rothschild who's really old and has this house that is, must have hundreds of millions of dollars of antiques in it. YBI3, Nate Boone. Boone ain't around. Uh, Brett is dead. White boy Rick uh, uh, fucked over my boy Scott Bernstein. I'm not interviewing him. What takes you more time during the research of the ed editing? Then people complain if the editing's not perfect. It's the editing. That's why a lot of these YouTubers just talk and run their mouth. Maybe, maybe that would be, since I have a lot of the research in my head, I could do more content if I just had some notes with talking points and, and just talked and didn't do so much editing. I'm going to try some of those. Thanks for the idea. We'll see if people like those and if I can pump out more. Here in North Carolina, people don't speak on things. North Carolina. Well, yeah, Frank Matthews is from North Carolina. Ike Atkinson was from North Carolina. And Frank Lucas from North Carolina. Three of the biggest black kingpins of that whole era. Down there now, I mean, like a lot of those small and mid-sized places, seems like um, not uh, an amalgam of real gang culture and the hip-hop version of gang culture has taken over. I just read a Guess there's a problem in Durham, Rally Durham with Bloods. There was just a big indictment of Bloods down there, though I doubt if they have any connection to California Bloods. But Malcolm Brewer, don't, you know, if you're not going to watch my stuff and you're going to say stupid shit. I don't do mostly black people. You're just lazy, so you don't watch much of my stuff, you bum. So watch it all. One more big documentary out like Heroin Heat. Well, Cocaine Condor is like 90% done. I just got to finish it. Why do you hate your own kind so much? Oh, my God. See, now here's the lunacy of people. So two comments in a row. One comment is that so I'm racist, right? I only do black people. And then the next one is I hate my own guy. So those two things are mutually exclusive. So where are these these people are drawing their so-called observations and analysis of me from the same data set observing me? And they have two uh, well, 180 degree opposite conclusions, which just goes to show much of what people say about public figures is simply a function of their internal and has nothing to do with what they observe. Can Al Chapel wife play the victim card? Well, she can try, but she's going to have to tell who made her the victim and what their address is and a bunch of uh, bunch of information. 
broken up. Beat. Oh, some of these people are like, maybe they're children. Like they might be 12. Al, Al, you're always losing it on people in the comments. I don't know if they're 12 or just like real clowns. See, the problem with this crime content, a lot of you guys watch it. Same reason I do. We're men. It's, I don't know. We like crime. Like we like sports. But there's a portion of the people watching this that are like frustrated. You know, they got bullied. I don't know they or they think they're tough guys or I don't know what it is and they you know want to try to get some brownie points off me or something but you know I can make myself available in the middle of Detroit or Watts in California or some other play locales around the country I can arrange South Bronx I can meet I can do a meet up with whoever wants to meet up with me. Do a doc on Mafia in Connecticut. Last real mob energy in Tri-State. Well, okay, If are you, by Tri-State, are you not including New York City? Because, I mean, they're still doing their thing in New York City. They broke with no work ethic. Yep, that's right. Greektown Mike, are you talking about from Detroit? Here, I'm going to tell you guys a Detroit mob story because he just said Greektown Mike. And it's also be illustrative of just really how dark these real mobsters are. So there's a little neighborhood in Detroit called Greektown. It's gone now. Greek people lived there up through, I don't know, the 60s. And they had their own organized crime up through the end of World War II. And my, uh, my street cousin's grandfather worked for like the boss of the, of the last little remnant of the Greek gamblers. And he said he got out of organized crime when his boss got found strangled in the trunk. So I said, oh, was your boss's name Gust Andromalus? And he said, oh, how'd you know that? Well, I knew who Gust Andromalus was because when the second generation of the Detroit mob came home from college and was getting made, uh, Tony's, Anthony Zarelli and, Will, and Bill Toko, uh, to make their bones, they kidnapped Gust Andromalus and they took turns strangling him to death in front of their fathers. And that's how they got made. And Greektown Mike was, uh, what was their damn last name? Oddly enough, my, my grandmother's half Greek. And her brothers, and I always thought like my mother was kind of, because my mother was crazy and would make stuff up. And she would intimate that my grandmother's brothers are some type of like enforcers for Greek organized crime. It sounded ridiculous. But as my grandmother was dying and she was telling me stuff, they weren't any big time people. They were just like leg breakers. But yeah, they were like strong armed guys for some, somebody in Greek, someone involved in Greek organized crime connected to the Italians. And Mike, the enforcer would have been above them, allegedly. Grew up in Southwest Detroit. My best friend was a white boy. Well, I didn't have the luxury of having any white people in my neighborhood, spoons and forks, so consider yourself lucky. Oh, you're in the Fed? Feds with RD? Okay. Shout out to RD. Al, do you like OG Shadow? Uh, he's fine. All the insults come from ignorant souls that don't have the intelligence or connects to do what you do for us. Thank you, sir. Think we'll ever do you think Detroit will ever boom again with the push for supply chain coming back to the U.S. Uh, well, when you say there's a lot of real estate, there's a lot of real estate all over the country. And the problem with old cities like Detroit is their real estate is no longer virgin land, right? It has old sewage lines and old sidewalks and old streets. And it also has to pay the taxes to support a city with the problems of crime and poverty. So, no, unfortunately, I don't think Detroit will ever come back. Will some more manufacturing come back to the U.S.? Probably a little bit. Doubt if it would be in Detroit or Cleveland or Pittsburgh city limits. Okay, a racist comment. What neighborhood you grew up in? I'm from Highland Park. Lived on Monterey and Woodward, and we lived on Six Mile and Woodward. Doing a great job. The streets recognize DJ Vegas. Thank you. OG Shadow is full of BS. Oh, OG Shadow 
who's the black okay there's the black guy who like the song reactions oh og shadow yeah uh, i think i know you're talking about the white guy like uh, i i couldn't take it more than a couple minutes but i ain't got nothing bad about it puritan in wyoming oh man puritan between Livernois and wyoming was like my second neighborhood Made a lot of money over there. Did a whole bunch of music videos. Got a lot of friends. I got taken to jail from Puritan and Woodingham. P A Y A one eight hundred seven Deuce. Free T stuck. Reg Dancy is home. Lucid Motors. Salute to the chat. Okay, somebody give me some damn money. Not that I need it, but it's fun. I only got twenty five dollars. Six mile and mile. Oh, yeah. What a piece of garbage neighborhood that is. That's a rough place. Um, Big Ed Hansard. No, Big Ed Hansard uh, did a bunch of time in prison, and Big Ed is out. Big Ed Hansard is out. I'm from HP2. Hamilton and Sturdivant, Leslie and Highland. Man. The phrase mean streets does not even. When did you live in Highland Park, Mighty Joe? Or I think about all these rappers getting killed. Well, I talked a little bit about it, and I was going to do some more about it. Um, it's actually totally logical if you actually think about it. So, like, I got my start in entertainment. I did rap videos in Detroit. I kind of was one of the people at the forefront around the old country of making cheap, decent rap videos. Like, of course, people had rap videos, but I was, I made, so I knew everybody in Detroit. I made 150 rap videos in Detroit. And now what's going on, and now I'm, I'm, I'm dabbling in the music with some guys, and I really have a lot of talks with them because if, it's not that hard to make decent music, right? You buy the beats that are popular. The engineers can make you sound good. Then say I'm behind it. I can make your video a couple bucks, whatever. But how do you stand out and jump up above? Like A.R. Ab and other guys go on Vlad and tell on himself. Well, another way is if you're just another half decent rapper, or you're another, you're good, but there's a lot of good people, but your crew kills King Von or whoever. Suddenly now your name's everywhere and all your streams go up. So if I was an evil, bad person, I could e easily create an artist right now and set events in motion where some people got killed for beefing with him, which would boost our streams way up. Then I would record a huge amount of songs of him all along, and then he would get killed. But we'd false flag it, and it would never get solved, and he wouldn't have had no good contract. And I'd get all the dough. And that may have gone on with some of these guys. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, because it's such an easy thing to map out. Like, I literally could do that. I mean, you have to be a pretty awful, you know. I mean, well, you have to be a, I guess you just have to be a gangster, because that's what they, they're putting them kids on the road with drugs and putting them in the spots and sending them out to shoot people in due time. So, you know what? I'm pretty sure that some of these deaths uh, are all setups from their own people. Not a lot of them, but a couple of them. So if any of you young rappers see this, be careful who you let big homie you or OG you or be in business with you and bring all your songs with you and don't let anyone know you're what you're making. And, you know, I don't know. Be, be careful. Move with caution. They call it Big Ed. Well, there was two different uh, rumors of why they called him Big Ed. He's a very short guy. So sometimes, obviously, guys that are short and have a, a big man complex, they'll call Big as a sarcasm. Big Ed claims he was called Big Ed because of the size of his manly parts. I wouldn't have any knowledge of that. Yeah, Big Ed is out. Yeah, I mean, I could interview, or I could, I could reach out to a lot of people for interviews. They don't necessarily, a lot of them don't want to do interviews, and I don't want to be that. I got a good reputation, and part of it is because I don't bother people about interviews. Like the people I interview reach out to me usually, or always, almost always, no always. I, I, people reach out to me, 
Because I don't want to interview people that don't want to be interviewed. I don't want to, you know, pitch myself to them and give them a resume. If they know who I am and they want to be interviewed, then it's a much better experience. Uh, Big Ed uh, talks to Courtney Brown Sr. I know Courtney Brown Sr. talked to him since he's been out. So if Big Ed or anybody else, definitely from Detroit, but almost anywhere in America, wanted me to interview him, they could certainly get in touch with me. And I, if he wants to be interviewed, I'll certainly interview him. Think cartels will be labeled as terrorists. I mean, I think they are. Why do you think OGs would set up their rappers? Would they not be cutting off their money stream? No, listen to what I said. So guys are constantly recording songs. Or some of them, they'd have a work ethic, like, say, Sada Baby or something. And so say I got this new kid with me, and, you know, we're putting out songs, and he's popular, and we're getting money. But he's also making tons of songs. He don't even remember all the songs he's making. Over the course of 18 months, I might have 100, 200 verses of his, more. Now when he gets killed, what, his 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 mother that's from some public housing projects, he's going to ban on me in court? I keep all the money. That's why those guys would do that. They would bank up their songs. And then when they get killed, they become more valuable too. I'm sure King Von, FBG Duck, all those guys' streams went through the roof. And they're not getting a cut. It's, it's dark. The new entertainment industry is really dark. And it has been from the time it was set up because it was created by criminals. I mean, not in total, but. And it's always been funded by criminals. And that goes for country music just as much as rap. Because the entertainment business is a very, you know, it's a risky business, right? You can put up money for a concert, lose all the money, uh, et cetera. So who's, what kind of people are young, are not risk averse and have a lot of capital? Well, it's criminals. So criminals are part of the entertainment industry and it, Excuse me, it's just very dark in the way that, like, you know, young guys killing each other is really driving money. So if you can be part of a crew that's killing people or getting killed, your streams are going to go up. Like, I mean, for sure, it's a it's a simple mathematical equation. More dead black men equals more streams equals more money. That's facts. Everything's always about money. I mean, just about, you know, unfortunately. I mean, it's not. Well, here's the thing. There are people, the people that survive in the street, the people that survive in the entertainment industry for a long time and have good reputations. You know, it's not like I could make more money. I make a nice amount of money. I could make more and I plan on making more by doing certain things that I won't do because I don't want to do them. But they would also eventually give me a bad reputation, they can put me in danger. But that's not why I don't do them. I just don't want to because I'm not that kind of person. But for some people, yeah, money's it. If you don't have anything inside and you, you know, you take away the fact that you're an ATM machine and no one wants to be around you at all, that's a bitter pill to swallow. So I'm sure those people get very bitter and they don't care about the lives they ruin and take as they go. You just think you know what's going on in Mexico. It's sinister. I don't think I know what's going on in Mexico. It is sinister. I mean, it's a lot of death down there. And a lot of it is probably killing just for the sake of killing. You think 69 will get killed? Yeah, you know, to be honest, I'm, I, I don't want to like be part of a murder conspiracy. So let me say this the right way. And I don't really care, you know, about stuff that much. When and if six, to the guys six nine gets killed, the world would be a better place. He's a real bad person. You know, like he got out of, he or he, he ordered a hit on his, you know, on Instagram live and got out of it by telling. I mean, he was the worst person in Treyway in a way. And, and he's out. I mean, he's a real piece of garbage. Like anything could happen to him and I wouldn't feel bad. And yet someone, he's going to run out of money. He probably is, you know, he's he's going to run out of money. It might take another couple years, but somebody's going to get him. Just going to GP because he's got it coming.
Uri, I'm going I'm to show this. Uri, Uri Bartman says, F-U-L, you ain't from HP. Yeah, okay. Uri. Please interview more security officers and create more content on the struggles of workers in the labor movement. We appreciate your support. All right. Um, security officers. Well, what about Hollywood bodyguards? I mean, that seems like a good confluence of talking about labor and security stuff and, and uh, what I do. So I'm going to work on that. Isn't that dude in witness protection? He was definitely the worst person ever involved. Blood. No, he's out of jail. No, he's not in witness protection because he broke his witness protection. He was supposed to be, but he revealed his location like a day after he got out. So he's not in witness protection. He's paying security to protect him, though. Twenty-four million views. I mean, so what? What is that? Of what? A music video? I mean, that's. Twenty thousand dollars. I mean, he's spending probably five thousand a day on security. Keith Class. Oh yeah, the seven footer from Hoover's. Al, you are Google Lab. The fentanyl game is yeah, fentanyl ain't no game. So someone asked me about a big project. Milligram is the name. And it's about what's really going on on the streets right now. It's about women selling themselves and scamming on Instagram. It's about lean getting cut with fentanyl. It's about rap labels used to lure in young guys to sell drugs. It's about putting pills on the road from Detroit to West V. And uh, it's going to be big. So. Just stacking up my dough right quick, and I'm going to get into milligram. HP was not half as safe in no time since 1970, buddy. It's been the murder capital of America many times. So you're just running your mouth like the sucker you are. Devil's advocate. Let's, let's see this guy. Show this clown. Let's see, think he's somebody. Safe. Punk. Devil's advocate is a punk. Pull up. Detroit on fire right now. That's right. Freeways are the new wild, wild west. What he's talking about is a lot of murders are happening in Detroit on the freeway. They're killing people on the freeway because nothing's open. All right, people, my good people. I'm going to pack it in. So this was a good inaugural, uh, inaugural stream here. I wish the quality was better. I got this. I'm on a damn uh, Ethernet line. But we're going to do a multi-cam next time. I'm going to get up out of here. Sayonara. It's been fun. Deuces. I don't know how to stop it. Oh my god, how do I turn off my line?